Hello, welcome to the show. This is Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing how to detach with love. So I've been flip-flopping, and I almost made this episode the Patreon, but I I got some pretty big news, and I decided to make this the public episode and make that news the Patreon episode. So if you're interested in hearing what my news is about, especially those of you who have been with this show since the beginning, I have some surreal, justice-filled heavy, complicated, but good news. So if you want to listen to that episode and help us reach our next Patreon goal that will give everyone at Patreon at every level access to a free movie night where we're gonna learn and grow together, come join patreon.com backslash emotional badass. Now let's jump right into what it means to detach with love. If you haven't listened to the first episode on detachment and my name's Stop now and go listen to that episode and come back to this one. Detaching with love is a gift that we give ourselves and the other people in our lives. And the first tip I have for you on how to do this, because that's what's tricky, right? In self-development and mental health, how do we do this stuff? Okay, so the first tip I have for you in how to detach with love is to allow the idea of shifting. Now, we are creatures of habits and patterns, and most highly sensitive people, we have had a lifelong or decades-long relationship with over-functioning, over-attaching, over-thinking, over-loyalty. To learn to detach with more ease and less guilt and people-pleasing, we must understand that you can't just hear me say this stuff. You can't just read this stuff in a book once or a few times and get it, y'all. Because it's not about being able to parrot back a message or get the words or being able to write it down. It's about being able to catch yourself in the moment of an old pattern, often an emotional internal pattern that then kicks off the pattern of our behavior. So a nuanced catching internally so that we can change those patterns. As highly sensitive people, we can learn to sense when we shift into an old pattern, like an unhelpful, anxious thought from the critical voice or an over-functioning poke from our codependent parts that say, shouldn't you reach out? Shouldn't you be doing more? Shouldn't you over-function? That's what we've always done. Shouldn't we always do that? When we can catch the shift our psyches or our bodies make, then we learn to catch that old pattern and we start to realize, ooh, we have so much power to catch this energy, to catch this patterning and shift it for our bodies, for our psyches. We can shift out of that old pattern and into new healthier patterns that we can practice until lo and behold, after days and weeks and months and then years stack up. In this practice, we can actually practice into a new normal. And over time, we can even create a new default. That's how much change is available. So I encourage you to just sit with and marinate to allow the idea of shifting, to sit with some self-permission that shifting outside of our patterns is good. It's wise. It's something we can very much do in all kinds of arenas, not just in the arena of a detachment. The second tip I have for you, think about yourself. Yeah, those are three words. Think about yourself. Now notice what feelings come up when you hear me say that. This would be a permission to shift back to thinking about yourself. And I know most of you out there know it because we will think way too much about what's going on with other people. And ultimately, even if this is from a genuinely caring place, this becomes a dismissal and avoidance of ourselves. It's not selfish. It's not self-absorbed. 
I can sort of hear that collective codependency that runs through our highly sensitive recovering communities, right? Doesn't that codependency want to say, aren't I supposed to be considerate and compassionate? And yes, yes, of course we are. But here's what our people pleasing and our codependency does to us. This is where we screw ourselves over accidentally here. It's your own life. It's your own one precious life. And if you are to think about yourself in your life and bring consideration and compassion to you to fill your cup versus trying so damn hard to make sure everyone else's cup is full around you while yours runs dry and you know you're parched and thirsty, a common scenario is when we need to detach from a person's energy. This common scenario is that Often we're in this place because another person is not taking full responsibility for their own recovery or for themselves. And often another layer of this is while wanting you to enable them. Notice your feelings if you are recovering from codependency when I say, stop thinking about them and focus on your own life. What comes up for you when you hear me say that as an offering? Many of us have been taught to Overfunction for other people. It's how we survived a dysfunctional family in our childhoods. So it's attached to our survival. It's why it's so scary to let go of overfunctioning for other people. Because at face value, right, we can see it. It shouldn't be scary. Oh, I just get to function for myself. That that should be a relief. Why isn't it? Because this is part of the psychological flip flopping that I talk about in a lot of episodes and a lot of my content that happens when we are in environments that are just way too stressful, whether that's a toxic environment or an inadequate environment, and we learn to overfunction to try to compensate for the underfunctioning that's happening around us. So a way to think about detachment is instead of attaching, there it is, instead of attaching to others so hard, I will let go and I will shift to attaching to myself, to my life, to my one precious life, to my goals, to my self-care. And when I do so, I will give them space to do the same. This is an act of love for me and for them when we healthily think about ourselves. And I believe it was last year's 2022 Boundaries course That someone said when I was speaking of such things, oh, like a sacred selfishness. And we all went, ooh, yeah, good, because isn't that good? Isn't that rich? We're learning to not be pathologically, destructively selfish and self-absorbed and self-involved to the detriment of others around us. We're just learning how to not enable and over-function and how to actually prioritize our one precious life a sacred selfishness. Tip number three, ask, what am I attached to here? And get specific. Brainstorm if you have to, or you want to. This will help you get clear with yourself versus lost in the emotion that happens between attachment and detachment. When I asked myself this question about why I stayed so many years in my first most toxic relationship. It wasn't really a question back then. It was more like a shame accusation in the form of a question, like a commentary on staying so long was stupid and dangerous and shame, shame, shame on me. I should have known better, shooting all over myself. When I looked a little deeper and took the shame-based judgment out of it, I found clarity that propelled me forward into the next phase of my life and helped me feel the release available in detachment. What was I attached to back then? This question helped me name it specifically and get clear. My stepdaughter, who I loved like she came out of my body. So my stepdaughter was my main attachment that kept me in that relationship. I was also very attached to the fact that I could say I was a part of a family. Because during those years, I was feeling it deeply, not even necessarily on a conscious level, that my family was in the process of, in a lot of ways, disintegrating and and coming apart at the seams. I was also attached to a fear of change. 
I was attached to doubting who I was and what I was capable of just because I was tired and scared. I had as much a, an attachment to a fear of staying the same, which had me sort of emotionally paralyzed and stuck, and a fear of changing, which had me sort of emotionally paralyzed and stuck. Fear will do that to us. In facing these attachments, I found clarity objectively versus emotionally. And we need this as a skill as highly sensitive people. We can't be all emotion all the time. It's too skewed. We benefit greatly from learning how to ground ourselves in an objective reality. I could see in a very matter-of-fact way that no matter how attached I was to my stepdaughter, her father and mother were not attached to me, nor me being in their child's life. And this made me face and see the utter powerlessness of my role there. And wow, did I have rivers to cry. But that river of tears eventually helped me float on that river to the next season of my life. In facing the family system I would lose by leaving this marriage, I realized more of the grounded truth than my fearful gripping of who they were. I realized that they were just mob-like in their family mentality, and dysfunctional families can be this way. That once somebody separates or divorces in a family, the family code is you're dead to them. And I felt that. And it hurt. In recognizing what I was attached to, I could see how powerless I was to change that dynamic. Where I had power was in the act of letting go, of detaching with love. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't detach with love from that ex, I detached with fury and anger and fear and survivorship trying to save my own life. But I detached with love from my stepdaughter and my former sisters-in-law and my former in-laws and everybody in that family that had embraced me. And it took me a while. I didn't just have the words. I had to work through my pain, my anger, my grief. Then I could detach with love. Healing is not linear and growth work is not linear. I wish it was. If there was a way to make it linear and just travel upwards, I would. But we don't trend upwards in our growth like that so smoothly. We sort of hill and valley as we hopefully trend upwards. In the moment of detachment, we stop over-functioning. And I did so much over-functioning to keep all those relationships going through exhaustion, through fatigue, through people-pleasing. And I know over-functioning confuses a lot of you who are listening. Maybe that would be a good live stream topic. I'll ask you guys at Patreon if over-functioning would be a good topic to host. It wasn't all on me to keep contact with the people who had been in my life. I might have felt like it was because I had grown up over-functioning. But objectively, we can step back and really see that in a relationship, it's relating. The nature of the word can't be done by one person alone. We need somebody else to relate to and with. They have some skin in the game too. It's not all on our shoulders. Sometimes as highly sensitive people, we want all of that responsibility. That sounds counterintuitive, right? Some of you are like, no, I don't. I don't want more responsibility than I have. I beg to differ. We want that kind of full responsibility because if it's all on me, then I have the power to make something happen. And when I don't have all the power, the truth is I just don't have the power to make it happen. And in avoidance of that sad reality, we will continue to overfunction. And many of you out there, just like me, because it's a dynamic. It's not really personal to us, even though it's the most personal stuff to us. That survivorship that I learned as a child, I brought that into every other relationship I had. It, of course, wasn't on my stepdaughter, who was a child. It was on her biological parents to value the bond that they had allowed us to forge. 
it was on them to see the value in maintaining that relationship. And as long as they didn't, I didn't have any power there to continue that relating. By detaching, it was like saying to myself, they are responsible for their part. And I will not own their part. I will just own my own. If people do not want to meet me halfway or do not see the value from my perspective, I can't and will no longer try to make them see it. In respect of my heart, my mind, and my energy, I will detach. So detachment helps us stop over-functioning and realize that others are responsible for their part. Whether we approve or not, they are responsible for themselves and I am responsible for me. That is why and how I was able to find the permission to detach when no part of me wanted to. I did out of recognizing the necessity and that the only person that was capable of making that transition easier on me was me through detachment. Fourth tip I have for you, work on boundaries. Yep, no joke. And the boundaries course has opened up recently. Find the code in the show notes or listen to the end to get a discount code. Y'all, so many highly sensitive people self-sabotage around detachment when they know deep down that they need to detach or disconnect. That self-sabotage shows up to give us permission so we don't have to do that heartbreaking work of detachment. The easiest example is when someone who self-identifies as an alcoholic in early recovery goes to hang out at a bar, dry, with old drinking buddies that they have nothing in common with except drinking and fun stories about the times they drank. That's it. If that person succeeds, it seems like a win. But really, winning is not putting ourselves in a situation where we either win or we fail. We can do so much better than that. We don't have to set up our lives to have white knuckling tests that set us up to either fail or win. Because to lose is a total unnecessary self-sabotage. When we self-develop and heal as a journey, we learn how to put down the self-sabotage. We learn how to listen to our wise woman that's dealing with the real stuff or our wise man who's dealing with the real stuff or at least is willing to. I like watching faces when someone is telling me something like, I don't want to call this person. I know I shouldn't. I know it's something I need to let go of. Uh, It always makes me feel terrible after I reach out to this person. And when I say, oh, great. So you know that. I'm hearing you say that you don't want to reach out to that person because you recognize that that's a bad move. So how about you support yourself in that and erase or block their number or both? When we offer ourselves the options that truly set up what our deeper self, our higher self, our intuitive self knows we need, our life moves forward. Now, on paper, that's what we all kind of want. But in reality, our human egos and emotional systems and nervous systems have some attachments, there's an attachment word, to change being hard or an attachment to fear. So how do we move forward if that's what's going on? Are you getting the theme? We detach over and over and over again. Can you hear why it's so important to me to teach a concept of detachment? If I go to the store expecting to get a certain item, maybe a certain brand of cream for my coffee or something, and I show up and it's sold out, that moment is an opportunity for me to either Practice frustration and annoyance and aggravation. They don't have the thing I want, which is what all of our egos want. We want the thing that we want it and we want it right now. When you're in those feelings, you're in your ego. And it's great when we get what we want and it's terrible when we don't. Emotional intelligence is about recognizing that and offering ourselves more and more ways to be in the integrity of truly taking care of ourselves. We have an opportunity in that moment to practice detachment and shifting. Okay, they don't have the thing I expected to have, letting go of expectations, another boundaries course lesson. 
Each moment of our lives is offering us so much. We can either practice old patterns or we can dig deep and offer ourselves just a little bit more wisdom, just a little bit more wisdom, just a little bit more wisdom and a little bit more until we turn around one day in our lives and realize, wow, I have paved a path with my wisdom. And I have done that for myself. It is an act of self-love. It is an act of self-respect. And it's something to be very proud of. So consider as you move through not just detachment, all of your self-development, this concept of really setting yourself up for success, of not setting up pass or fail tests, of being your own cheerleader, your own encourager. So if you figure out that your best bet is detachment, just set yourself up for success. And if you feel resistance in doing things like erasing or blocking a number that you know is not in service of your best self or best life to call, work on that in your journal or work on that with a therapist. Don't get lost in the back and forth of should I stay, should I go, should I call, should I not go. Really sit with How can I set myself up for success in my life? How can I waste as little time as possible in the pursuit of my goals? How do I get out of surviving and into thriving? There's also a bit of a wave, like a cultural shift that I've seen in recent years from people just younger than me and younger than them. I'm in my 40s, so I'm really talking to y'all if you're 40 or below. Many young people seem to have pride in never, ever ending past friendships or relationships and holding on to people into forever. Now, sometimes holding on is very healthy, but sometimes it's very toxic. Now, it is glorious to healthily shift some relationships from romantic status to maybe a good long-term friend. That can be done. Connection can be maintained when you are important to each other in your lives in different seasons and have moved on in different ways. That can be very right for someone in a situation. But those people really have to have the maturity to do so, to genuinely renegotiate those relationships, to be very honest and clear within themselves and each other. But there's also a time and a place for a clean and clear break And clearly defined, no crossing boundaries. And not clearly defined boundaries for the other person to adhere to. If you join the boundaries course this year, I'll teach you about finding your power in boundary settings so that people cannot and will not cross them. Believe it or not, the boundaries we set, when they're healthy, when they're effective, they aren't for them. They're for us. So just things to consider on this path of figuring out when do we attach, when do we detach, how do we attach, how do we detach. These are fantastic muscles to strengthen as highly sensitive people, survivors, and people in recovery. Light and love, y'all. If you want to learn more with me, I teach live. This is not an evergreen course. The Boundaries course is six weeks I teach three times a week for four weeks, and then we have review sessions for the next two weeks. It is a deep dive into everything boundaries. Those of you who have already taken the course, look for your email because you get a very special re-invitation at a very reduced price. So light and love. And if you struggle with knowing what boundaries are, boundaries will help you know when to attach and when to detach, believe it or not. Allow yourself to learn and grow. Boundaries are the containers that help us feel safe, that help us feel whole, that help us define where I start and stop and where you start and stop. And then we have such a better time negotiating what happens when we come together and overlap. And then it gets wonky. Whose responsibility is what and where? This is what we learn from Healthy Boundaries work. Early bird code to save a full $100 on the full price, or you can pick a payment plan that is as low as $37.50 a month. If you want to pay in full and get the discount, use the code EARLYBIRD23 for the Boundaries course. Light and love. 
I'm an emotional badass. You are an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets Mindful. Bye-bye.